good afternoon, everybody. I just hope that it's okay that I'm not just going to talk about soil today. I'm very glad that I can do this virtual uh, forum and wanted to kind of give you a story of my um, research, um, going um, abroad first and then coming back to Alana. I was curious how many of you in this room um, have seen this figure before. Um, so this one, I think some of you do know. Um, this one is the figure coming from Beijing. And I got really fascinated by air pollution there. Um, and I started uh, researching air pollution, especially when I went there first time in 2006. And I asked people, so what do you think about this very bad air pollution? And some of them looked at me and said, what do you mean air pollution? There is no air pollution here. This is all just fog. And that just completely blew my mind. Um, and that, um, that made me feel it's, it, it would be very interesting to work on this problem. And so that's how I got into research. Um, and then what, what I mean by air pollution um, is this particulate matter. I got very interested in these very small particles, uh, suspended solid and liquid particles in gas. And we've been very interested in the PM 2.5, those particles smaller than 2.5 microns or less, or PM 10, uh, smaller than 10 microns. Um, maybe many of you are already familiar with it, but um, you can compare that, the size to the fine beach sand. So the each sand is about 90 microns, uh, and your hair um, is about 50 to 70 microns. So these particles are very, very small. Uh, you cannot see them um, unless they scatter the radiation so much and make visible air pollution. And so many of you would know what happens when you inhale a lot of these particles. Uh, what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is the human um, lung tissue. At the top is when you're just exposed to very clean air, and then the bottom is when you're exposed to a lot of PM 2.5 or PM 10, the particles. So they get very red and inflammated and obviously causes a lot of health issues. And in, um, in addition to that, um, there is also agricultural impact. It can, uh, air pollution can also cause crop yield loss and um, aesthetic problems. So then I thought, okay, what might be causing this and how can we deal with it? What, how, what can we do to make the air pollution um, better, like less? And my naive self thought that vehicle emissions is the way to go. And so what I'm showing you here is my modeling study. Um, on the left hand side is showing um, my scenario uh, simulation analysis, looking at if we implement the Euro 3 emission standards for vehicles compared to no emission standards, how much uh, air quality improvement can we see? And so maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, but this is Japan. I am from Japan. And so I wanted to have Japan a little bit inside the domain. And then this is China. Um, and so you can see um, that within the eastern part of China, that's where urban cities are located. Um, Beijing, Shanghai, if you know a lot about China, and even if you don't, maybe you know, the eastern corridor is where a lot of industrial um, activities take place as well. And so that's where we're seeing the big decrease in air pollution when we implement these uh, emission standards. And you might notice that this was the 2011 study that I did, but I was projecting for 2020. So if I were to go back and do this again, I would ask why did I just do the Euro 3 emission standards instead of much more stringent ones? Um, they were supposed to have implemented Euro 6 by now, but they decided that they're not going to do that until 2021. And so right now what um, China has is Euro 5 emission standards. Um, what I did in this study was comparing every car being Euro 3 emission standards compared to nothing. And you are seeing more than 10 micrograms a cubic meter decrease in concentrations because of that. And I just wanted to point out that for some species, 
you do see a bit more reduction if you were to go further down. And so this would have been um, much more reduction if I were to have done Euro 5. But then after having done this study, I, I said, okay, maybe it's better to actually see where these emissions are coming from. So then I realized, I thought transport was so important, but then that was at the end, at the bottom of this thing. And so I said, well, I did this research, but then it probably didn't make much sense that I was just looking at vehicle emissions. The concentrations are reduced by more than 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And so what that means, um, it's probably better to compare that to the WHO standards and also the existing U.S. standards. So the WHO annual mean is 10 micrograms per cubic meter, and um, 25 micrograms per cubic meter is used for 24-hour mean for PM 2.5. And so I think that um, being able to reduce this much is um, quite significant. For the U.S., 24-hour um, standard is 35 micrograms per cubic meter, and the annual standard is 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So what I was saying was, um, looking at China's emissions, I found out that um, transport sector is actually at the bottom of the emissions um, graph. So even though naive me thought that vehicle emissions would be important, I realized that it's actually not too much of a big emitter. Uh, what I'm doing here is trying to show what we know about China's emissions. I'm showing from different emissions estimates. There are different inventories that exist for China's emissions at different sector level. So the red is the industry and these different symbols are showing um, different emissions estimates. Different symbols are for different estimates and different colors are for different sectors. So then I, I, I thought that it was interesting that um, the residential sector emissions were fairly big. So you can see the blue kind of in the middle after the industry. And so I asked, why would that be? And that led to our work on Tibet. Uh, the picture is coming from our first study in that was called Nanso. So you have the map of China there um, with a star from Beijing. And I have the three Tibetan populated regions of China um, on a, a bit bigger scale. So this one was actually coming from a Tibetan autonomous region. In the purple area uh, around the center, um, it says in red Nanso. So that's where we, we did this first study. So as you can see, they are burning inside the house, the fuel without any chimney. And so there is a lot of household air pollution in this region. Um, there are different types of houses. So some of the houses actually do have chimney. Um, you can see that from the stone and wood house on the top right. The one the top left made by Yak Hair, uh, it takes a long time. This is the most traditional Tibetan tent that they used to create, and then it goes by generate passed on to the different generations. Now, um, fabric one is becoming more popular, and you can also see the chimney coming out of there. This region that we went around Namphon is very uh, touristic, and so there are a lot of touristic offices that are made of uh, these uh, sheets, profiled steel sheets um, that you see on the bottom right as well. What we were interested in was to figure out what causes a lot of household air pollution. This is the study um, done by one of my PhD students. Uh, we went to different parts of Tibet uh, this time. This one was our most recent study in Sichuan province. So that's the uh, calm area in yellow. And we were measuring in both agricultural village and in a nomadic village. Um, this is in a log scale. And then we found out that um, the indoor PM2.5 concentration levels are very different, statistically significantly different between the two village types and also um, among the household fuel types. So if they are using electric electricity, it's very, a uh, very small number of household using electricity compared to yakdong. As you can see, um, using yakdong is 
very polluting. I have never seen yucks. I, I as mentioned before, I, I wasn't so into animals, and so I didn't really know much about yucks or yuck dung. And so this is one of the yucks that we um, come through when we drive. And they collect the dung like this so that they can use it for fuel. It was pretty interesting to me that they do that, but then the yucks are sometimes considered very sacred as well. And so they have a ceremony in the morning as well to burn it and then kind of their ritual. This one was taken by my then master student. This was when we did the field work in another part of Tibet. But this one was very non touristic and we found a lot of yak hair um, tents in this region. And this is uh, one of those yak hair tents. And you can see that this stove actually has a chimney, but it doesn't go to the top of the tent. Um, and you might be able to see that there are openings on the top of the tent. But on this day, it actually snowed. And so they were putting a sheet on top of that. So they were burning and everything was just staying inside um, and, and so the maximum PM2.5 concentrations that we saw was actually 157,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Do you remember the WHO 24-hour average guideline, 25 micrograms per cubic meter? And on the hazardous air quality days, what we see is about 500 micrograms per cubic meter. And so you can imagine how how much air pollution this might be. Like you cannot even see the other end of the tent. And what came to my mind was about this health link that I told you about. So there is a lot of death linked to outdoor and household air pollution. Um, this one was made by WHO, the World Health Organization. The most recent global burden of disease study estimates about 2.9 million premature deaths annually due to ambient PM2.5 and 1.6 million deaths due to household air pollution. So it is a smaller number now compared to 7 million that they used to think. That is still a very important area of study. We don't know which um, particulate matter or chemical species are important, for example, for health. There's a lot to do still. But what was stunning to me was when we asked these residents what they think about this air pollution and you know if they're worried about health they it's just like when I asked them about air pollution in Beijing they looked at us and they said what do you mean air pollution this is what we are used to you are probably not used to it that's why you feel air pollution but this is how we live and this is, doesn't do anything bad for us and then what was interesting to us was that even though they said air pollution, you know, it was not air pollution for them, uh, they did worry a lot about climate change. And so that made me think more about climate change and the links to air pollution. You can actually see that aerosols have a lot of impact on the climate. So maybe many of you have seen this slide. Um, this is taken from the Governmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC Fifth Assessment Report. So what this one is showing, the energy difference between what's coming in to the Earth and what's going out. So if there is a positive value, then that means there's more energy that's um, stuck on the atmosphere, so it's warming. Uh, and if it's negative, there is more going out, and so it's cooling. Uh, what's interesting about aerosols um, is that the level of confidence for cloud adjustments, how um, the aerosols um, impact cloud is really not well understood. And so that's the low level of confidence. One of the main uncertainties we have for understanding climate change is exactly this. And aerosols, some of them are cooling, some of them are warming. And so I thought that this was very interesting and I wanted to explore a bit more. I'm having different types of um, emissions coming out. So you can see on the top right that um, diesel uh, exhaust, very, very black, so there's a lot of um, black carbon coming out of there. Um, bottom right is dirt kilns, there's a lot of black smoke coming out too. Uh, on the top middle, that's uh, power plants, it's also very black. 
the climate impacts these aerosols can have, these black ones are very, uh, as I said, um, black carbon. They can be very absorbing because of the cutter as well. So they are warming um, the atmosphere. But some of the other aerosols, the ones that we were seeing, for example, in the tent, they're much more white. So there is a lot of organic carbon coming out. So what's happening is that's not you know, incomplete combustion uh, coming from biomass burning. That can actually scatter radiation more. And so um, that, that could be cooling the atmosphere. So those different sources I found um, be very interesting. And then I went back and think, so what are the actual sources of air pollution? So we covered a little bit of transport emissions and we covered a little bit of household energy. Uh, we mentioned a bit about industry and energy supply. So the remaining is uh, waste management and agriculture practices. I'm not going to talk so much about dust at all, but that is something that we should um, think about. So instead of for the waste management, um, CARPA is here as well. Um, there is actually a lot of um, garbage burning that happens in the world. And so those are often unaccounted for. Those are often not regulated, especially in lot of the global south. So we've been doing some work um, in Nepal trying to understand how much garbage burning is happening and what is being emitted and what kind of chemical composition comes out of this burning. What this one is showing, a uh, very similar study, so this is also a scenario analysis running the chemical transport model with different emissions estimates. Baseline is having all the emissions that we think exist without garbage burning. Garbage burning is not something that is usually included in the model anyway. And then in scenario two, we try to include one of the existing global garbage burning emissions estimates. In scenario three, we change that existing um, garbage burning emissions estimates using our most recent emission factor estimates and then put that into the model. And you can see that OC concentration uh, increased pretty substantially in the scenario three. And because of that, um, PM10 and PM2.5 is also increasing as well. And uh, on the right-hand side, it's just the difference. So uh, where it's increasing is it's in the Indo-Vantan Explains close to the Nepal border in the India region, you can see. And that's very prevalent for OC. So if you uh, remember, again, the WHO, um, the 24-hour mean, 25 micrograms per cubic meter and 10 micrograms for annual mean, just being able to um, reduce those emissions, I think, could be very powerful, especially in these countries where garbage is burned. Okay, we're getting close to soil now, so I wanted to look at um, agriculture, and I was first very interested in how these agriculture um, affects air pollution. And then I thought there is a lot of buzzwords related to climate smart agriculture. Is there a way that we can grow corn where we would not emit so much? When I say emit, um, I'm not really looking at particulate matter here anymore. I'm more interested in gases, so greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and nitrous oxide. Um, I apologize, I didn't go over that in the IPCC figure when we did. But those are the three major um, greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. And then also in agriculture, there is a lot of ammonia emissions, which is a very important precursor for um, particulate matter, secondary particulate matter. And also ammonia is the basic uh, gas that is contributing to the environment as well. And so we were looking at four different types of agricultural techniques um, to see if there is any way that we can actually reduce all these emissions of four species. So let's start from the right. The no cover crop figure is um, just a traditional way of farming in a way. Um, so everything is bare. We just put corn and 
a lot of fertilizer, so 150 kilograms per hectare. Living moat is, I'm going to explain in a little bit, this is having uh, white clover together with corn. Zero rye and crimson clover, um, you might be able to see the difference. It's not the bare soil, so we have the cover crop, zero rye, crimson clover as cover crop, but then they are killed before the corn is planted. Zero rye um, is not a nitrogen fixer, but crimson clover is. And so crimson clover is able to provide both carbon and nitrogen to the soil, whereas zero rye is giving uh, only carbon. I'm explaining um, living mulch system. So what that means is that this is the system that Nikhil, my UGA counterpart, has been working on. So we plant white clover in the winter so that they grow a lot over the spring. And then uh, when it comes time to plant corn, we create a strip here so that um, the corn is planted in between white clover. As corn grows, then it shades the clover and then they start to die. And so this is about when, this is after harvest. So you can see that there is still some that's left. So they're not completely dead but um, they mostly fade away and provide nitrogen to the soil. And they're perennial, so they can come back again uh, without planting. They can continue on. And then the good thing about this is that we don't have to be providing synthetic nitrogen fertilizer because it continues to provide nitrogen when corn needs it. Um, this one was a study by my PhD student that just graduated. So Sam was looking at the greenhouse gas emissions from these fields. And so first, what we can probably notice just from the soil texture, this is the bare soil, the traditional soil. This is their rye, crimson clover, and living mulch. Very different. Um, there's a lot of clay biocarbon, organic carbon um, inside the living mulch. And you can also see that living mulch emits the most CO2. This is after we take away the CO2 emitted by white clover themselves. But because there is so much organic carbon in the soil, there's a lot more soil respiration happening as well. So it's not as easy um, if you sequester carbon, you can also emit carbon. So it's very difficult um, how much you can actually is it really climate smart? And if we, I forgot that, uh, I realized I don't have the N2O nitrous oxide slide, but for nitrous oxide, um, living mulch was also the highest among the whole plot. So we, what we wanted to see was that the living mulch would actually be a, a way to sell as climate smart agriculture, meaning that, you know, we can get similar kind of yield and we don't have as much emissions, that would have been best. But so far, we are not actually able to see that. And we are not putting the fertilizer, but still, we find a lot of nitrous oxide emissions because of what's coming from white clover. But what led us to think about was um, the regulation that we don't have in Atlanta. This made us think a lot about the um, urban agriculture as well. And we've realized that there's so many people that are now trying to do urban agriculture in Atlanta. The city of Atlanta is um, starting Atlanta for a while now. And many of you might um, know this already. And um, there's 300 community and urban gardens in Atlanta, which is, this is great if you think about it, I think. The first starting point for them was that we have so much food desert, um, people that cannot get to fresh produce within a mile of distance uh, from their home. And urban gardening and urban farming clearly is one way to mitigate that problem. But what we also found out was that there is no regulation by the city of Atlanta or federally for the farmers or anybody to test the soil before they grow food and sell. We've been thinking a lot about these agricultural techniques and we knew that 
or it could be very contaminated. We know that urban areas have a lot of different sources. There used to be leaded gasoline. There was leaded paint that was used. And so that legacy effect could also be on the soil. And so we said, is it okay that we measure the soil before the, the city of Alana really tries to expand this urban agriculture? And one of the sites that we measured um, had higher than 400 ppm of lead. Um, 400 ppm is what EPA decides to be the threshold for residential soil. And so that raised us uh, even more concerns. And we were able to receive a Hercules Point grant from Emory to work on this. On the left-hand side, what we found out was that people were actually pretty concerned about heavy metal contamination. There were obviously some that said not concerned at all or not very concerned, but 40% and 11% of people said that they were either concerned or very concerned. But what was interesting to us was when we asked to the same number of people, are you concerned about your own garden? Since many of them were gardeners, they said, no, they were not concerned, even though they hadn't tested. And so that also uh, was a bit of concern for us. This was one of the students' work, my own student, Lauren Ballopin, does did the survey. And then what was most concerning to us was the finding of these flags um, that you're seeing on the right-hand side. So to me, they look like rocks at the beginning, and they do look like rocks, but they are most likely coming from the lead smelting facilities. So they are um, the waste material from, I think, most likely from this neighborhood probably in the 60s or so. And they seem to have been dumped um, in this neighborhood. We found one lot that had mounds of these flag materials. And when we measured, it was more than 4,000 ppm of lead. And this was heartbreaking because there were so many kids that were going on these mountains, biking because they thought it was fun. And some of the gardeners um, we're using these black pieces as ornaments because they look very pretty. Some of them look very pretty, like shiny. But then we contacted the uh, EPA and the Georgia Department of Public Health, and that led to the Superfund site investigation. So starting from that empty law with mounds of slag, they, the EPA started investigation for 360 lots at first. Um, they were trying to get more soil samples from the area, and they were finding a lot of lots that had much higher than 400 ppm of lead. And so now they've expanded the site to 1100, almost 1100, 1068, I think to be exact. And they've also started excavating the soil because they were finding that 50% or more of what they are sampling was higher than 400 ppm. And many of you might know that these investigations take a long time. And so they decided that it would be better for them to start excavating. And when they started excavating, uh, we found out that after they excavate for about one foot or two feet, there is a lot of slag in the soil. And so those were used as uh, foundational materials uh, in the past. And so that's what was happening. And one of the EPA personnel told me that they dug a feet and still they could not get past the flag. And so they just put an orange mark and put new soil. I just fear that the area that they are investigating is not enough, potentially, um, and we don't know enough about uh, where that might be. So uh, what we've been doing since then is really to uh, raise awareness of this issue. I, I didn't really think about soil contamination until I started thinking about air pollution and then realized that this could be having another heavy metal contamination. And so just to 
had that in people's minds that this is actually a problem. And I am getting more concerned now that the coronavirus is really making people do more urban agriculture. If we didn't know about it, it could not be a good thing. You could potentially grow uh, plants that can take up heavy metal and you could be eating them and you could, you could be consuming that way. So when you grow food, you also uh, work with the soil. The soil itself can be contaminated if you have your kids and your kids will be exposed. And we are also really pushing people to test the soil. Um, we try to provide free soil testing. That's what we were planning to do before the Atlanta Science Festival got canceled. But I would also love to hear your thoughts on what would be the best way to move forward in this um, COVID era when it's very difficult to actually be doing the testing together. What can we do to raise people's awareness and also to um, enhance the practice of having a healthy garden? So I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about the other part. Um, I take students to the climate change negotiations. And so what we started doing was to have webinar series. So it's just like this have the speaker come and talk for about an hour. We are having three more seminars this month. So if anybody is interested, I would love to have you come to the seminar series and listen in and have um, discussion together with our speakers. And if you have anybody that you're interested in listening from, I'm also open to suggestions as well. I just wanted to thank all my collaborators and especially my students that really did the work for what I presented. I'm not able to mention all my collaborators, like Priya, who's always behind the work um, on this project for us. But I'm so grateful to everybody and all the funding sources. And thank you so much to everybody that has joined in today. And again, I apologize for all the problems, but I'm happy to take questions if there's any. I was referring to the indoor coke stoves, I think, but the question is, do they have ways to deal with carbon monoxide? You would think that it would be a problem with a fire in an enclosed home like that. Um, I think that that question came up when you were saying that people, a lot of them feel like they're not concerned about, the, they're like, you know, this is just the way we live and it doesn't impact us, is what some people said. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, um, it's, it is still very leaky. And so it doesn't get to the point where um, it gets hazardous, but I'm very sure that the carbon monoxide level is very high as well. And so it could lead to health impacts. Um, what I've realized is I think it's very similar to probably the so heavy metal contamination in West Solana. The awareness is very low. And so um, I guess when the awareness is low, you wouldn't do anything about it. And so the things don't improve. So what I've been wondering was how can we increase that awareness? And I don't think that's a science problem. Um, how can we work with different um, searchers so that we can combine our knowledge to make that into a better society, I guess. But that's, I, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. And then there's another question, which says, does the living mulch system better avoid or mitigate issues of nitrogen leaching than common fertilizer application? Yes, thank you so much. A great question. So yes, so the living mulch is definitely better. Uh, um, and so we have not we have not been able to measure the leaching aspect, but the infiltration rate, for example, um, is very different. And so I'm very sure that nitrate leaching is uh, much more reduced compared to others. Um, and then, you know, erosion and things are obviously um, used as well. So for the soil health perspective, living mold is great. And I'm just trying to figure out, is it possible to also reduce the like, gas emissions as well? Have you thought about offering uh, to mail people kits so that they can collect soil in their area and then send it in for testing. Yeah, so that's what we uh, we are testing out now. So we are starting a video series. 
so that we create a video of how they can collect the soil so that they can do that themselves and then ship them out. Um, I wasn't sure if we should also be providing the kits or if it would be possible for them to use whatever they have, but do you think it's necessary that we provide the kits as well? Uh, what kinds of different scientific methods do you use to reach your conclusions, um, i.e. experiments or data analysis? So um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So I used to be just a modeler. So what I used to do was to just collect the data that's available and run the model and compare with existing observations. Uh, I realized that um, that was very limited, and also many students actually wanted to have more hands-on activities. And so that's how we decided to actually go measure at the farm, even though I'm not an outside person. I got used to it, I think, recently. Uh, and it's kind of an experiment, I guess. So we put the chambers, the colors. Um, you probably saw that on my slide. Put them on the farm and then measure from different agricultural techniques. Um, we don't do any of the lab experiments, but so yeah, we do the field work, and then what I do the most is to get the the data that measured, then compare that to the model results, or use that data to improve the model. So I do a lot of model development as well. So one of the work I didn't show you was developing the emission estimate emissions parameterization into the model so that we can use different parameters to estimate how much emissions are coming out in the model. So that's a little bit different from the data analysis per se, but then you do uh, compare with the observations and try to see what fits best. Okay, we got another one. Um, this is uh, Mr. Liam. Less a question, but more follow-up idea to Brandy's. I know you had mentioned communication community agriculture in the Atlanta area. I know a number of CSA systems distribute their produce in boxes and include recipes slash ideas, how to use what's in the box. Perhaps a soil kit could also be included for those who also home garden. Just that is an excellent idea. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I missed sure no, no, yeah, I interrupted I, you. No, no, I was just saying that was just more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Verifying. Yeah, that is a brilliant idea. I love the CSA box that I get from the Oxford farm. Um, and then I think that would be brilliant. Um, to, yeah, so one of the things that I thought about also was to go to the faith leaders. Um, because some of them um, go to the church events quite a bit. But yeah, I, I guess the people that are interested in gardening uh, would potentially be getting the CSA boxes as well. One, one problem, though, I, I feel is that uh, what we are finding also is that some of the compost is also contaminated. And so there are definitely, I think that there is a need for testing compost as well. But um, is that something that's feasible for people to do? And is that going to create too much of a uh, fear uh, among the public? Just trying to figure out what is the best um, messaging and how can we do it in a positive way rather than just scaring people away. Okay, um, we have another question. What are your best suggestions for plants to grow for bioremediation that the average person would have access to and would look good for a home garden? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. So um, two of the studies that we recently did, I couldn't, I couldn't um, include this in the talk because um, we are now finalizing the paper, but we've tested different types of flowers. Um, and then we found out that some flowers could potentially be good. Uh, cowpeas are good, but then cowpeas can, we found that they could get to the edible part. And then if the kids were to eat those edible parts and if the soil was very contaminated, that could actually be harmful to the kids. So what I'm suggesting now is um, the sun, sunflowers are great, but we haven't tested the seeds. And so I don't know if Americans would eat the seeds from sunflowers. I doubt that. And so I think that is probably okay. 
And then um, amaranth um, seems to be also a potential. They were very pretty. So we were also wondering if it might be a good idea to give them out the seeds um, for the residents to try out if they were interested with a big um, note that it's, you know, just doing it once during the summer or so definitely does not need to mediate um, as, as much. We have to continue to do that to really be able to get to the level if the so is contaminated. So there is a grain of salt there for sure, but um, it might be a nice way to raise awareness uh, if the neighborhood could do it together and understand what might be going on. Okay, we've got one from Chelsea. I think there are a lot of outside people who would love to help but don't know what to do. Uh, perhaps publicizing an organized citizen scientist volunteer day to get people to collect samples for you. And also, she loves the idea of including soil kits in the CSA boxes. So, yeah. That's a brilliant idea. Okay. So there is a citizen science day? I think she is suggesting there be a citizen scientist volunteer day. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. Volunteers that we have at the garden love this kind of stuff, and they don't know what to do, but they always wish that they could help. So if we could say, go to all of your gardens, we could get the materials to one place and distribute them and say, hey, go test, send in soil samples from these two neighborhoods, and you take these three neighborhoods and distribute out a map. Oh, I would love to do that. Cool. Can we connect and yeah. 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 Yeah, that would be great. I love it. That's that's so wonderful. Thank awesome. you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say uh that we should get in contact with um a woman, Natasha at the city of Atlanta does she's the the um recycling coordinator, but she does a lot with compost in communities, so she could potentially get out word about the compost having heavy metals and know who would be able to test that, I guess. Okay. Otherwise, yeah, so we can test the compost as well, but I'm just wondering uh, who to do that. So then, like, maybe if we're able to do the Citizen Science Day, we can also do the soil and the compost if that's the garden, and then make sure that there is no contamination. That would be perfect. That's great. Cool, lots of great ideas. Uh, I don't see any more questions here in the chat. Okay, thank you, Priya, for moderating questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was so great.